Okay, so now we're coming out of the long choral ode. Notice, so far we've only heard from the Watchmen and this chorus of old men, and now Clytemnestra appears at the palace door. Uh, huge symbolic significance to that, of course, because you know she's the one in control of the palace as the queen. The chorus speaks to her, so these opening lines are here, um, and notice what they say to her. I've come out of respect for your power, Clytemnestra, for it is right to honor the lady of a ruler when the man leaves his throne empty. Notice that that's kind of a sort of underhanded dig at her, right? We come out of respect, but we're only coming out of respect really for your husband. He's the one who left the throne empty, and so the right thing to do is to respect you because you're his wife. We don't respect you as your own person. We respect you because of who your husband is. Um, and you'll notice throughout this opening, uh, opening exchange between the two, the chorus and Clytemnestra, that you know there, there's a lot of veiled and then sometimes rather open hostility between them. Um, so they ask her what she's seen, what she's heard from uh, from the Watchmen why she's giving up these sacrifices. And she says that uh, the Argives have taken the city, Priams, and they wonder, they, they say they're in disbelief. How is that possible? Um, and she says, look, I said it already. You know, Troy belongs to the Achaeans. Um, they express their happiness, though, and then they ask why she's sure of this. What's her proof? Um, so they know, they respond with some initial skepticism here. And then she says, I have proof. Um, and then they ask her, you know, are you too respectful of appearances in dreams? So basically, did you have a dream that Troy fell? And she says, I wouldn't accept the fancies of a drowsing mind. Well, then they respond, has it been some rumor? And she says, you're faulting my intelligence like a young girl's. Notice, she doesn't appreciate their skepticism or hostility. They're basically saying, look, woman, you, you must believe this because of some rumor or dream. And she says, what do you think I am, some young girl? Um, and then she goes on to tell them um, that the night has now given birth to this day. Um, again, this light-dark imagery coming back again. And they ask her, wait, how could a messenger have gotten here with that kind of speed? And she explains her extraordinary plan to get the message that Troy had fallen. That from Troy, once it had fallen, someone would get up onto a mountain and light a fire. And there would be this sequence of fires all across the Aegean that would then send the message, right? Because nothing travels faster than light. And if we flip back in here to our map, um, we see that from Mount Ida, there was a fire lit. Um, that was seen over here on uh, Lemnos, and that, fi that fire was then seen over here on Mount Athos. Presumably, along these question marks, there would have been ships planted that would have, um, that would have uh, lit a, a fire signal. And all these signals finally coming back here to Argos. So that's how the message got there. Clytemnestra wanted, remember, she wants to be the first one to know that her husband's coming back. So she comes up with a rather ingenious plan. I mean, you have to give her credit here. Um, a rather ingenious plan to make sure that message gets there faster um, than it could have been possible to, to uh, send a person, right? Um, and these, she says, her, that were her arrangements. This wasn't Agamemnon's plan to send the message to her. This was her plan, okay? Um, and remember what we heard from the Watchmen, that in her heart she plans like a man. This is one example we're seeing of her planning like a man, okay? Um, there's a, a further discussion um, of what it's now meant for Troy to fall um, that the Trojans are captured, and we move on here to um, to Clytemnestra. She's now convinced them, the the chorus, that um, that Troy has indeed fallen. 
Um, she does allude here to the fact that uh, she worries that the, the Greek soldiers will ransack uh, what is left of Troy and be overcome with greed. Um, and certainly that is something that befalls the, tr the Greeks on their way home. Um, she says, if they were returned with, to, to return without sin against the gods, and we know from the Iliad, or actually we know more from the Odyssey, really, um, that they weren't able to return without sin. They did sin against the gods on their way home um, in their ransacking of Troy. And now they close in their words to Clytemnestra, you speak good sense like a prudent man. Notice the way she convinced them was being like a man. Um, and now that I've heard your convincing proof, I am preparing do address to the gods. And this launches us into um, another extended choral ode. Clytemnestra goes back into the palace, and we have this extended choral ode that, um, that further is, you know, a thanks to Zeus, and then also goes back and explains some of the things that led up to this great destruction of Troy, um, this clash of civilizations, okay? And we see here the allusion to Paris and disgracing the host table, violating the, the code of Xenia by stealing Helen. Um, and, uh, and so that's, of course, the origin of the Trojan War. Um, we have a lot more sort of this background on the, uh, the Trojan War, the role of the gods in it, the suffering that ensued. Um, all of that takes us all the way up to 487 here. And now they end their song and dance, and they go back to speaking. Um, and they now see that a herald is coming. And our next section, uh, our next video will be about the arrival of the herald and the interaction between the herald and the chorus.